Praise the Lord. What an awesome song service that was. Everywhere you look, everybody's going through it right now, being fought on every side. And there is never such a time as this hour that we're in that we need that connection with God. We need him in absolutely everything that we do and everything that we say and think. And that is very clear at this present time. So, Father, we thank you once again for you. We thank you for everything that you do for us. We thank you, God, for drawing us closer to you, for putting that surrender in our hearts to you, that we can be filled with more of you. We thank you for your anointing that's here. And we just ask, God, that you would have your way, that your holy angels would come forth and minister to each of us everything that we have need of right now. And God, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're going to discuss tonight is the sword of the spirit. It is a weapon of warfare, and we are going to learn, really, it's just a refresher of the basics, because I myself have found that sometimes I run dry and I lose sight of the basics, and there's no shame in that. Life happens, things happen, and you find yourself worn out or maybe looking around saying, I don't recognize this path. And we have to get back with God so he can put us back on the path we're supposed to be on. So what is the sword of the spirit? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit in summation is the word of God. This sword is one of the pieces of armor that Paul tells the Ephesian church to put on as part of the full armor of God that will enable us to stand our ground against evil. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13. That is why you need to get God's full armor. Then on the day of evil, you will be able to stand strong. The sword is both an offensive and defensive weapon used by Roman soldiers in those times. We're talking about swords in general. In this case, the sword of the spirit is a weapon belonging to the Holy Spirit. Swords were used to protect oneself from harm or to attack the enemy to overcome or kill them. In both cases, it was necessary for a soldier to get rigid training on the proper use of the sword to get maximum protection. Their very lives depended upon that rigid training. Every Christian soldier needs the same rigid training to know how to properly handle the sword of the spirit. Our very salvation depends upon it. Since every Christian is in a spiritual battle, with the satanic and evil forces of this world, we need to know how to handle the word properly. You see a lot of prophets, teachers, whatever out there that are twisting the word. They are not using it properly. They're, they're misguided in their understanding and in their interpretation of that word, and they lead other people astray as a result. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty option raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. 
To be a Christian is to be a warrior. A good soldier of the cross must not expect to find ease in this world. Rather, it is a battlefield. Amen. (laughs) The soldier's occupation is war. As we put on the full armor of God each day, we would be wise to recognize to ourselves, this warns me of danger. This prepares me for warfare. This prophesies opposition. This should be a realization when you're putting on the full armor of God. We're not putting it on just to be comfortable. We're putting it on because we are in battle. It is battle mode. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, it's training in righteousness. The soldier, battlefield, training. These are all things that come with wielding the sword of the spirit properly. It is a spiritual warfare mentality. Many people know how to swing the sword at the devil, but unless they have applied the word to their own lives first, they do not know how to grip the sword properly. In other words, when they pick up the sword and swing it, it is a lopsided and heavy swing, and they are unable to take a defensive stance after an offensive move. These are people that do not apply the word of God to themselves in their own lives first. We should be judging ourselves with the word of God. Before we point the sword at anybody or anything, we have to go through that self-check first. Are we judging ourselves? And if we're not doing that, we're picking up this sword saying this is the word of God and just swinging in the dark at the enemy but we're off balance. We're not well-rounded. We have darkness in us that prevents us from fighting effectively. And that is why the enemy comes around the corner with a, a parry or a dodge and he strikes us and gets us down because we weren't prepared in battle the way we ought to be. This is why many Christians are defeated by the counterattack and oftentimes retreat and do not stand their ground. Wielding a sword involves many different stances and techniques. This is especially true when the sword serves as both an offensive and defensive weapon. The word of God, the sword of the spirit, is similar in the context that we must learn its functions and how to wield it properly. We must learn what techniques are best suited for our present situation, when to use it for offensive and defensive purposes, as well as what stances to take with it. Okay, so sometimes life is happening, man, and the battle's hot and heavy. Sometimes your best offensive move is to enter into the presence of the Lord. You don't have to even pick up the sword. Because you need God, just alone time with him because he needs to speak to you. Or it could even just be you need to be filled with his presence. Maybe you won't even hear God say anything and that's okay. Because you're sitting in his presence and it is doing something. God knows what he's doing. This is all discerned through the Holy Spirit and given through the wisdom of the word of God itself. Only then will the sword be an effective defense against evil. It will also be an effective offensive weapon we use to demolish strongholds of error and falsehood. God refers to his word as a sword in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. God's word is alive and working, 
It is sharper than the sharpest sword and cuts all the way into us. It cuts deep to the place where the soul and the spirit are joined. God's word cuts to the center of our joints and our bones. It judges the thoughts and feelings of our hearts. When we're reading the word of God, we should be inviting the Holy Spirit to be with us, to help us understand that by his spirit, that word can jump out. You know, you read the word and something jumps out and it's like, oh, wow, that just answered something I was wondering about. It just gave me wisdom and how to handle a problem that I'm having. That's the alive and breathing word of God that's being properly interpreted to you by the Holy Spirit because you asked him to come in. And it's giving you sharp discernment, wisdom, and insight that God wants us to have. So it cuts right through all these evil lies of the enemy. It cuts through deceptions from, from people. It cuts through the heaviness of situations and circumstances that all of us are going through. And it gets right to the point of an issue. So that's the power of that sword. And we have to have the Holy Spirit in order to have it used in that way, to have that effectiveness that it was designed to have. Here the word is described as living, active, and sharper than a double-edged sword. The Roman sword was commonly made in this manner. The fact that it had two edges made it easier to penetrate as well as to cut in every way. The idea is that of piercing or penetrating, the word of God reaches the heart, the very center of action, and lays open the motives and feelings of those it touches. In the context of spiritual warfare, the purpose of the sword of the spirit, the Bible, is to make us strong and able to withstand the evil onslaughts of Satan, our enemy, Remember what Jesus said when he was being tempted by the devil. It is written. That's his sword right there. The first thing he did was go right for that sword, the word of God. And that's how you defeat the enemy. The Holy Spirit uses the power of the word to save souls and then to give them spiritual strength to be mature soldiers for the Lord, to fight the kingdom of darkness and advance the kingdom of light. That's what we're doing. We're getting people saved. Well, the Holy Spirit is through us. And we're teaching them. We're training them. We're being real with people and opening ourselves up to them to say, hey, this is what happened with me. And this is what God can do for you. People are encouraged by that personal level of connection and communion. And it gets them closer and closer to Christ so that they learn to stand on his foundation, to depend on him for every situation and circumstance in their lives. The more we understand and live the word of God, the more useful we will be in doing the will of God, and the more effective we will be in standing against the enemy of our souls. The sword of the Spirit is sharper than any two-edged sword. The intention here is that it will cut anything it touches and to the deepest levels of it. This is one of many reasons why compromise can have no place within the Christian warrior, in other words, the strategy of the sword is to either utterly cut down or completely block the object that has been targeted through discernment. So compromise is like not letting the sword cut all the way like it's supposed to. Compromise is going to hinder your defensive action and allow some of those attacks to get through. And that's why we can't have any part of it. Logos and Rhema, talking about the word of God, the sword of the spirit. The Bible uses two different Greek words to refer to the word of God. 
one of these words is logos and the other is rhema. Understanding the meaning of these two words can help us know and experience God in a deeper way. Logos is used to refer to the whole written word of God, which we have recorded in the entire Bible. It is through the Logos written word that we can learn about God and know his ways, his salvation, and his plan for mankind. But we can go much further than this and know God on a personal, intimate level and experience him subjectively. This is where Rhema comes in. Rhema refers to the instant, personal speaking of God to us. He wants to communicate with us not only through his written word, but also by speaking directly to us in our situations. This instant speaking from God comes to us from within our spirit and is based upon the Logos word from without. Sometimes we receive God's rhema word as we're reading or praying with the Logos word. So you're sitting down in front of the Bible, you're just reading it, and all of a sudden you get this like a prompt or you hear like a, a thought or a voice and God speaking to you some scripture or the meaning of a scripture as it pertains to your situation in life. That's the rhema word that God is speaking to you. Sometimes we receive God's rhema word as we're reading or praying with the Logos word. God may also speak a specific word to us any time during the day or night. Usually it's late at night after you've decided you want to lay down and go to sleep. <laughs> but get up and listen because it's important if God is speaking. You don't want to miss it. Logos and Rhema are crucial to our Christian life because God uses both to speak to us. If we do not know how God speaks to us, we will be hindered and ineffective in our purpose. And I think that's an important thing to teach people is how to hear God's voice. He speaks in different ways. And sometimes it takes a person a little while before they can learn to trust that that's God's voice talking to them. And so we just need to be patient with people and teach them this is how God works. He wants to speak to you so that they'll at least be listening. So how does it work? As we read, study, and apply the written Logos word, it becomes rooted and embedded in our spirit man. We may not remember the scriptures or be able to recite them all the time or at all, but if they are being understood and applied, then they are rooted fully in our spirit, which is where it matters most. When you get something down in your spirit, it is there to stay. And God can draw upon that anytime. God will pull the right scripture up from our spirit man at the right time and give us the words to say at the right moment if we have these stored up within us. In this way, they will be anointed because God has directed the thoughts, remembrance, and words to be given. And God's purpose will unfold in that moment. Sometimes you don't even know that God is working through you. You're just in a situation, you're talking, and it's really ministering to somebody. And God is using the knowledge and wisdom that he has given to you to pour into that person. We don't have to know when God's using us. We just have to be, have the word of God stored up in us and just go about our business, always listening for the Holy Spirit, asking him to have his way in our lives, but then just go about your business, go about your daily life. And God will pour out from you what he needs when he needs it. In this way also, God can speak instant rhema words to us. These can guide us towards him when we take heed to them. An example, you're at work or school and you're angry about something. The more you think about it, the more problems you experience and the deader you feel inside. All of a sudden, amen, right? This, this is real. 
the more you think about that thing, it's like a little hamster on a wheel. That wheel just keeps getting faster and faster, and that hamster never gets tired. And that thing just keeps going and going. All of a sudden, part of a scripture pops into your head. Let's use Romans 8, 6, for example. If your thinking is controlled by your sinful self, there is spiritual death. But if your thinking is controlled by the Spirit, there is life and peace. Immediately you realize, wow, no wonder I'm so dead inside and frustrated. I've been setting my mind on my flesh and the problem. I need to turn back to the Lord and set my mind on Him. A little light bulb goes off. Now, it's not always easy to be like, oh, gee, wow, that's what I'm doing wrong, and then turn around and do the right thing. That can be a process, given the situation that we might be in. But that's what we need to do. The point is that when we set our minds on the problem, that problem is going to continually get bigger and bigger and bigger. So what we need to do is, with, by the word of God, we set our minds on Romans chapter 8, verse 6. If our thinking is influenced by the Spirit, there is life and peace. So take a step back from the situation. God's in full control. We're not that powerful that we're going to take the whole thing and mess it all up and God's powerless to do anything. Give it to God and walk away from it. Focus on what is good and right and just. The battle is in the mind. Then, as you pray and set your mind back on Jesus, you begin to experience life and peace once again and are then able to hand over the problem to God and walk out the solution. How did all this happen? God used the written Logos word that you've been studying to speak an instant and personal rhema word in your particular situation. The rhema word does more than help us in particular situations, however. It also imparts the spirit and life Jesus spoke of so that we can grow in him. It also washes us so we can be inwardly transformed. It is by these two functions that God works out his purpose in us. In John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. God's rhema words that he speaks to us are spirit and life. The original Greek here for the words that I spoke, the Greek term for that is rhema in, in the Bible. The words Jesus spoke are spirit-filled and contain life-giving power. We can be transformed and renewed in our minds by the watering, the usage and application of the rhema word put into practice, exercised, to become more like Christ. The key for us to receive the Lord's rhema words is to exercise our spirit when we come to the word of God. The best way to exercise our spirit is by prayer. Commune with God. Praying constantly. You can just talk into God while you're going about your daily business. That's prayer. So as you're praying and communing with the Father, you're opening up your spirit to be sensitive to God's rhema word, to be sensitive to his his Holy Spirit that wants to speak to us, that wants to move through us, that just wants to to be with us. It's, It's a relationship. He wants to be with us. Doesn't get any better than that. So by praying the word, we come into contact with the Holy Spirit in the word And and the words on the page are no longer simply words, but become spirit and life to us. This is how the word of God feeds us and supplies us with life for our growth in Christ. The battlefield is in the mind. 
And if we, if we continue to think and meditate on how things aren't going right, if we think about what's going to happen tomorrow and how am I going to do this, you know, weeks, months, years down the road, whatever it may be, maybe it's something in the past that, that we can't seem to let go of or, or that we, we hold over our heads. Oh, man, the more that we entertain those kinds of thoughts, the more the enemy has an inroad, has an attack path to us. And that stuff's not healthy. You would be surprised how things will start turning around in your life when you start decreeing and speaking out life affirmation words from God's word, prophecies that he has spoken over your lives. You have to, when, when we get prophetic words, we save them on the computer. They're right there in a folder so we can click play and re-listen to it because I forget what God says and I know at times I need to go back and listen. Oh, this is why this is happening. Because all that time ago, God said, and now here I am. But any time that God tells you something's going to happen, he always gives you some kind of hope. He always gives you some kind of instruction of what to do in the midst of that situation. And then that's what we need to do in the midst of our situations. I have a book entitled, How to Defeat the Enemy of Your Mind. Now, this book explains to you exactly how the enemy will target and attack your mind to get you to that place of stagnation, to get you to that place where you cannot fully effectively serve God in the capacity that he has for you. And how it works is he uses the situations and circumstances around us. And he gets us to look at those things. He gets us to constantly... And he'll put them right in front of your face 24-7. It's right there. The reason he does that is because he knows that if we can come into agreement with all these nasty situations going on around us, then he can strengthen and solidify his footing in our lives. Then we start reacting emotionally to the situations around us. We start lashing out maybe you know, at different people around us. And that's, that's not okay because now people are getting hurt in the process. Then we start saying things that we probably shouldn't say. And then once we start doing all that, then we start convincing ourselves. We start believing that, well, this is how it is. It's always going to be this bad or whatever. Now you're decreeing and declaring these things, the thoughts turned into emotions, which turned into actions. And it's a big mess now. And God revealed all this to us in, in this book. So it's normally $15. There's probably four or five left. I, I just want to get rid of them tonight. So it's only five, if you're interested in that. It's a, it's a really good book that the Holy Spirit showed and explained how the enemy does this and what we can do to not only protect our minds to guard our hearts against these kinds of uh, strategies of the enemy but also how to counterattack these things and go back to the words that god spoke over us to break curses that we may have spoken over ourselves or others and to speak the blessings and the promises that God wants to give us over our lives. Because everybody's going through it right now. I, I believe God told Pastor Barbara uh, last service that she's now on the front lines. That is a hot and heavy battle place. It's, it's an intense position. So how many of us are on those front lines or are getting ready to go on those front lines? And then... Now we need the spiritual warfare, new strategies from the Holy Spirit. And we just need to be seeking the Holy Spirit to find out how does he want us to be fighting in this hour because the enemy comes with new tactics, new strategies. And we can't always rely on the old that, we, that we've known and used in years past. God wants us to have fresh revelation 
fresh insight about what the enemy is doing specifically now. So, Father God, we just, we thank you, God, for your, your wisdom and your anointing. And we thank you, God, for, for teaching us and instructing us on how you would want us to, to fight the enemy in spiritual warfare in this hour, to proclaim the promises you have spoken over all your people, over this whole generation. And Father, we thank you that you're raising up this younger generation to be mighty warriors that are strong towers that you can use to go forth, to bring in all those that are hurting, lost, and dying. And God, we just give you the honor and glory. As the Lord of the harvest, we pray for more harvesters in the field, Lord. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the altar call this evening, if you want fresh revelation knowledge of the spiritual warfare that God wants us to participate in for, for yourself and for others, then please come up to the altar and God is going to deposit in you the wisdom and the revelation that you need in how to fight the enemy in your life and in the lives of your loved ones.